back with the curve here. This thing is huge, many meters tall, and the termites that build it are only centimeter scale. So it's roots of millions of termites still together, and some of them are just huge mounds in which they live. One thing that's really interesting and common about these systems is, of course, they have this internal structure, which is really amazing. So you have these collectives that are basically self assembling a complicated internal structure, but also both of them are self repairing. So if you cut off the arm, uh, of a starfish, it can actually grow that arm back. The uh, mound, the mound will actually regenerate. It'll self-repair itself. So both of these systems have collectives that self-repair. And these two are really, to me, very remarkable, remarkable examples of what very simple individuals can do together. But they're really just one of a really large set uh, of examples that we have in nature with very, very large groups of very, very limited individuals, um, especially limited in size compared to the phenomena that they're part of can cooperate to create complexity. So for biologists, these systems remain completely fascinating. And the question you might ask is, you know, how do they do it? How do fish work together? How do termites work together? But as a computer scientist, these are also fascinating. Because just as Maria and you were talking about, we want to create systems that have multiple robots working together, multiple computers working together. We want to scale them up. <coughs> how do we design algorithms that can do the same thing? So whether you think of uh, food tracking, or fighting fires, or agriculture, or warehouses, or even a future where we have self-driving cars, right? you now have a huge collective of, of essentially robots working together. Uh, and even in more futuristic scenarios, you know, maybe we can make robots that are the size of insects, robots that can pollinate plants, or we can make our own programmable materials that are like multicellular organisms that can be programmed to take on different shapes. So all of these different examples, we're trying to increase the number of individuals, but likewise, what we're going to expect from an individual is going to be less. They're going to fail, they're going to be unreliable, they're going to have limited knowledge compared to the group of size, and that's going to increase. So understanding how to program these things, biology provides a good source for us to look at those systems and say, how do they work? And how could we make them work for us in a completely different setting? Um, for me, another motivation is also just science trying to understand how complexity arises from simple units. How do local decisions that we make as individuals affect the collective? And I think there's just a really big area within computer science that thinks about collective intelligence. Uh, and robotics is one way of really testing that out. We can build collectives, and we can see if our theories about them work, uh, which is hard to do with natural systems. We can't go around always messing around with what they do. Okay. So um, I was going to talk about two projects from my group. Um, we work in a couple of different areas. We work a bit on the theory, uh, and we also work very closely with biologists who study cells and study um, insect colonies. Um, but the two projects that I'm going to show you are examples where we're using inspiration from biology to design robotic systems, both build the robots and try to program large-scale group, group behavior, and try to make this relationship between the local behavior that the robot does and the global behavior that we expect the collective to do. So can I have a collective behavior and actually derive the local rules that individuals should run. And can we do this in a little bit of Okay, so the first project sort of parts back to what I was saying in the beginning of termite now, uh, as being this amazing example of you know, centimeter scale individuals that collectively build things that are much larger than themselves. Uh, and what's really remarkable about these systems, uh, in addition to the fact that these robots climb over one of the things that they build, and, uh, do all kinds of manipulation that's really amazing. Um, what's also interesting is that there is no supervisor. There is no termite that's telling all the termites what to do. So somehow, all of these individuals are able to collectively contribute without even necessarily knowing what the other half of the colony is up to. So if you could do that, you could create an amazing system that could work together over large areas, which is what the termites are capable of doing. So of course, um, we also like to build. Uh, we like to build our own kinds of towers. Um, but now imagine that we could make robots that could build for us. And they could build in areas that were dangerous. Maybe they could uh, build levees in floods. Or maybe they could build things underwater for observation. Um, how would these robots work together? Well, it would be nice if we could do the same kind of thing. Make lots of robots, throw them at the problem, have them build not trying on but what we want, but still be resilient and robust and parallel and decentralized the way we have termites, uh, the way we know that termites operate to the extent we know how termites operate. So one of our uh, current projects, or long-term projects, has been inspired by 
by trying to try and build robots that, uh, that can construct. So one of the first challenges, of course, is making robots that can do some sort of beauty construction. For example, climb over the very structures that they build. So putting together climbing, manipulation, and sensing all the different factors. So these are our Chinese robots. Um, as you can see, they have these specialized kind of wheels uh, with spokes. These are called WEGs. These were actually invented in Case Western University, uh, but also built off of work um, on a famous robot called Rex. It makes climbing very easy, uh, almost by accident. If you move next to something, you automatically climb it. Um, so it, we try to make very simple robots where the very structure of those robots is easy uh, for them to operate. So using as much mechanical as we can. So here the robot is actually navigating over the structure. And when it's off the structure, it uses distance sensing. And when it's on the structure, it can look at these patterns. So from a robot's perspective, it has a very localized view of the world. Okay, um, so besides, the second part, besides or the third part, besides navigation and motion, is manipulation. So it has a very simple arm that can lift up blocks uh, using only one motor, so it just has a sort of spring loading and automatically opening and closes. Um, and this is just an example showing a little bit more put together. So the robot is moving to a particular location and then finds a location where it wants to put the block. And the thing to notice is actually, first of all, blocks look like Legos for a purpose. Robots have a hard time doing precision tasks. Um, so we try to make it as robust as possible. And the robot uses a lot of different kinds of sensing. So when it places a block, it jiggles around the block, it feels its sensor, it tries again. So it tries to compensate for errors that we know it's going to make. It makes errors in climbing, it makes errors in placement, but it uses different kinds of simple sensing behaviors to try and be robust, rather than being perfect from the start. All right, so this is just a video showing an individual robot with all of its pieces put together. So we obviously by hand constructed the staircase. Um, and the robot can pick up a block, climb up the staircase which it knows, the structure of, and then place the block and sort of climb over the place thing that it just placed. So hopefully that gives us our first start toward the robot that can physically do the tasks that an individual would have to do. So the next step is coordination. Um, how do we get multiple robots to, to work together? And can they build something for us without a supervisor? So we show that you can actually design compilers that can generate rules for specific types of structures. So you give it a picture, and it generates the rules that the individuals will get that they work together. And the rules sort of look like traffic patterns. It's kind of instructing how the structure will grow. So the key thing is that these robots come, and they interact with the structure, but they don't know how many robots there are. They don't know if robots are editing other parts of the structure. So you can imagine there are lots of ways you could create cliffs, or you could create uh, enclosures, or you could block all the robots. But there are ways to design rules so that even if many, many robots operate together, and they follow those rules, you'll actually always get the correct structure at the end. So there's two different kinds of structures, uh, classes of structures, that you can actually design compilers for. So this shows an individual robot actually running one of the rules. Um, so as you can see, it comes to the sort of landing strip, receives a block, which is still being hand placed, uh, and then builds a structure. And the important part is that each time it comes back, it doesn't know what's happened when it wasn't there. So maybe the structure broke and it needs to be repaired, in which case it just looks for something to build. It actually doesn't even detect that there was a fault. It's constantly just looking for something to build. And so if another robot, or grad student, builds part of the structure for the robot, then again, it can take advantage of that good situation and build. And this is actually how a lot of the coordination happens. And one of the principles that's believed to be true in many ant and insect systems, that they react to past work. Rather than reacting and talking to other uh, ants, they're actually using synergy, or what work has happened in the past to direct what they should do in the future. So this is sort of one of our final experiments where we showed three robots uh, working together. The robots are uh, there's no sort of overhead camera or anything. The robots have all of their sensing and activation uh, within them. And they're really mostly unaware of each other's presence. They come to the structure and they try to build. Uh, and the only interaction they have is to yell, get away, get away, get away. So basically, don't fly. So if one robot is too close to the other, he'll sort of wait and one of them will take the turn. It's basically simple traffic rules. Um, and we can build simple structures, structures like wall structures that we want, uh, maybe more solid structures as well, 
Um, but you can imagine that the next step would be to make robots that could move around beams, or they could build roof structures, or build multi-story houses, or whatever else you can imagine. Or maybe move around uh, bags or, or other kinds of structures that we might carry out in the environment. But there's still a lot of work to do. So one example you can see here is that each of the robots, of course, compensates for mistakes, but there's still ways in which we don't know how to fix the system. Like, what if one of the robots breaks down and just stands there, right? Termites will drive away the dead termites. We still don't know how to do robots that can actually do that. So there's still a lot that needs to be done to make this system practical. Okay. Um, so the video I showed you uh, had three robots. And of course, I was taking inspiration from termites that have about a million individuals in the colony. So there's still clearly a big gap uh, between the system I showed you and what we can do. Uh, and in any of the collectives that you think of, hundreds of thousands of, of individuals can cooperate. So one question is, what would it take for us to create robot systems at that size? We'd like to be able to experiment them, to test the different kinds of algorithms, task allocation algorithms, for example, like Maria was suggesting, on larger numbers of robots. Uh, and then maybe we discover also what parts of our model do we need to consider. So if you have a thousand individuals, is that same as 100? Is that same as 10? Or are there failure modes that we've just never seen before? Um, so both programming and building robots at this scale is still something really hard. Uh, and one of the goals in our group was to try and create the first level test bed in which we could do these kind of experiments. And we called it the kilobots. And the idea was, you know, can you buy robots to be kilos? So how do you make a thousand robots? Okay. Um, so one key aspect of making a thousand robots is cost. So if you if you have a lab, maintaining and keeping a thousand robots is quite a bit of work. So we use a number of different uh, interesting ideas. So we use cell phone vibrators for motion. Uh, these reflect IR off of the line so they have wireless communication and sense distance, but they can basically you can program them, they can communicate with each other, and they can move. And once you have those basic elements, you can actually put them together in many different kinds of group behaviors. So these are just showing some examples where one robot is orbiting a bunch of other robots uh, by measuring distances, one where it's moving straight. Um, and these kinds of behaviors, uh, people have studied in swarm robotics, for example, James McLaren's work uh, at Rice University, done many different kinds of behaviors. So now we can start to program those behaviors on these robots as well and see if we can understand them. Uh, so in our group, we look at many different kinds of collective behaviors, some inspired by ants, uh, or fireflies in this case, some inspired by cells. And the key element in all of these behaviors is that an individual robot actually doesn't have that much knowledge. Maybe it can talk to 10 robots in its vicinity, but it doesn't know what's happening all the way across. So any kind of algorithm, that information has to propagate. The other thing is, they all operate at slightly different times. There's asynchrony, there's message loss, there's bumping, um, there's failures. And so whatever algorithm has to be able to constantly repair and constantly adjust to the fact that some fraction of robots will never do the right thing. So this is sort of uh, one sort of fun video in the uh, But an example is collective transport. So very often, you go to a place and you can see groups of ants cart off things together. Uh, they don't know the shape of your potato chip, but they're very good at making sure it gets to their nest. So how would you make robots that could go into an unknown environment and move things together without knowing the exact shape, or without knowing the exact weight distribution of an object? Ants do it. Can we learn how to do it? Do we understand what happens when hundreds of robots do it together? Um, this is just another example um, of collective behavior. Well, actually, this is individual behavior. So the robots have a light sensor in addition to interacting with each other, they can sense light. So they're climbing up a chemical gradient. So how do you move up the set of information? And one of the reasons I like this video a lot, besides the fact that it's a fun way to question together, is you can see not every robot is the same. A lot of robots do the wrong thing. Uh, and a lot of robots do the wrong thing for a little time and then recover. And you can clearly see that like, this one's really OK. Like, there are a whole bunch that are going the opposite direction of light. Even if there have 10% of your robots misbehave, how do you make an algorithm that's robust for that? Um, this is just another example. I know this is cycling through quite different examples, but each of these are simple, simple behaviors. Pattern information, movement, uh, climbing gradients, synchronization. These are kind of basic 
collective behaviors that we like to compose together and think that they're sort of basic behaviors that any person should have, and then maybe complex behaviors will compose those different behaviors together. So here, we're using a very simple, well-known idea of pattern formation, where you have a source of information, and the colors represent how the information is flowing, how many hops the information had to go through the system. And that kind of tells you the distance from the source. Uh, and so this just shows that those kind of patterns can be made self repairing So if I move the source, the pattern will adapt according to the source. Okay. So again, our goal is to be able to put these things together and make complex behavior. So here's an idea um, from Mike Rubenstein from his PhD thesis at the uh, University of Southern California. What if you could get, make sort of a programmable material where you could program the individuals and then they could self-organize into whatever shape you wanted to get them. And here is Mike as of now, uh, and our first, uh, first set of experiments with full thousand robots was to be able to create that kind of uh, complex behavior. Can we get groups of thousands of robots without any human intervention to actually self do some sort of very complicated behavior? Mm -hmm. uh, and the key thing to know with this highly sped up movie, which you can tell is highly sped up because you can see like flitting around, is it took about 12 hours. So 12 hours of thousands of robots operating together and you're not allowed to and it turns out there are lots of things we didn't understand at all about what that meant. So the algorithm itself, how does it work? It basically composes some of the examples that I showed before, like pattern formation, um, robots orbiting other robots, um, forming coordinate systems. These are sort of well-known algorithms. But we also had to add a number of different things. What do you do when robots fail? What do you do when robots make mistakes? What sort of immune system do you add to the system to deal with all of the rare failures that are going to happen if you have a thousand robots? So just to show examples, um, you know, here's a simple edge falling behavior. Well, you actually get traffic jams. You get traffic jams that cause so much congestion, everything stops. Uh, every time robots form patterns, they form it slightly differently. Um, many times robots stop and have to actually reboot and figure out themselves. And maybe eventually we'd have to have groups of robots that cart off other robots. But with a thousand robots, you start to see every rare failure that we used to be able to correct by taking the robot out. Um, nevertheless, we can make lots of different things now and program uh, complex behavior with thousands of robots and start to understand experimentally what it's going to take to recreate or even create our own groups of these collectives that have large numbers uh, of groups working together. Um, I, our group is part of actually a much bigger community that studies collective intelligence. So, of course, within robotics, there's many different examples of thinking about how robots can cooperate together. So these are two examples of different kinds of construction. Uh, so, for example, quad rotors, uh, building large-scale structures, or floating bridges that can basically form by self-assembly pieces together. Um, there's more complex forms. We thought of just cooperation, but imagine that there's also competition. So, for example, robot soccer or any sort of adversarial environment, like in the case of the fires, where robots have to act under kind of constraints. There's so many examples where we would like to be able to increase the number of robots working together. Uh, and on the other side, I think there's just a lot of scientific questions too that we can't necessarily understand by changing the brain of a fish or changing the brain of a hand, but maybe we can understand through engineering. So actually be able to build those rules, test them in robots, and understand how well do we understand the general principles that maybe we think are operating in nature. And I think in this way, both computer science, biology, and robotics have a lot to offer each other. And it's also very fun. It means you can work in all disciplines uh, and justify it uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy the experience. Okay, so for that I was going to conclude, um, and the most important fact is that all of this research is itself the product of collective intelligence. So I have an amazing research team that I work with, uh, and in particular, um, Justin and Kirsten uh, are the two people I've worked with closely on the Termis project, so building termite like robots. They've also traveled to Namibia multiple times uh, to help with studies of actual termites. Uh, and Mike is the one uh, whose work I showed on the kilowatts, uh, and also Alex Carnegie, who's worked closely with Mike, so on both the theory and the design of the program these robots. And the kilowatt robots are actually available for purchase, so you can buy them from a company called KT. So now we actually have several labs that are using the kilowatts, uh, and it's been a really great way to trade 
of both algorithms and idealism. Is it that we're just fundamentally thinking into our 